Um, hello, a very warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Uh, my name is Professor Chris Baker. I'm Professor of Religion, Belief and Public Life at Goldsmiths University of London. And I'm also Director of Research for the William Temple Foundation and it's this organization which is hosting this webinar. Uh, the William Temple Foundation is an educational charity founded in 1947 uh, in memory of Archbishop William Temple which advocates the principles of social and economic change, catalyzing community transformation, commissioning pioneering interdisciplinary action research, sponsoring doctoral students and appointing research fellows. The foundation promotes dialogue, addressing the issues of the day. Uh, the theme of this evening's webinar, uh, developing spaces of trust in a digital age, Disinformation, Democracy and Religion emerges out of the work of our Ethical Futures Network, curated by one of our senior research fellows, Reverend Dr. John Reader. The network explores the role and impact of religion and belief in the context of climate emergency and digital technology. Our webinar features two regular contributors to that network, uh, who, I'll, who I will introduce shortly. They will both outline the positive and negative ways in which religion contributes to this highly pressing issue, both from a US and UK perspective. After they have spoken, there will be, of course, a chance uh, for any questions, comments or reflections from you, uh, our audience and our floor before they then each offer some final reflections on what they've heard from you and from each other. The recent US presidential election saw the widespread use of digital platforms to disseminate fake news about the democratic outcomes of that election. The majority of Republicans who voted for Donald Trump now appear to believe that the election was stolen from them. This belief has involved the willing complicity of religious groups on the evangelical right as, um, and others to fuel conspiracy theories such as QAnon and to interpret the attack on Capitol Hill on the 6th of January as a sign of divine approval for a holy crusade against the forces of wokeness and the left. So in this webinar, we want to reflect further on this nexus between disinformation, democracy and religion, paying particular attention to the role of the digital. We are asking, can religion, as well as acting as a conductor for these disturbing trends, also act as a conduit by which to confound them? We will be recording just the speaker's presentations for wider dissemination, and we will be live tweeting this event using the hashtag spaces of trust. So please do join the Twitter chat if you are able to do so. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker this evening, the Reverend Dr. Eric Trotzo. Trotzo is a pastor of the New Jersey Synod of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and an honorary research associate with Australian Lutheran College University of Divinity. His areas of research <clears throat> include eco-theology, digital and post-digital theology, contemporary continental philosophy, the theologies of Martin Luther and Paul Tillich, and theopoetics. His most recent publication is entitled The Cyber Dimension, a political theology of cyberspace and cybersecurity, published in 2019. Uh, Eric, we've given you and our other speaker 15 minutes. You're very welcome. And we look forward to hearing from you uh, right now. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you. Let me just share my screen. All right, thank you. It is good to have this opportunity to share with you. I'm going to start um, recently and then work back a little bit to frame some of these thoughts. So about a month ago in February, 
Stephen Miller was quoted in the New York Times as saying, the struggle over the lexicon is actually the central struggle. Now, Miller was a senior Trump advisor. He fought to have Trump use phrases like radical Islamic terrorism and to remove phrases from government websites such as climate change. In this article, he's responding to the reversal of many of those changes by the Biden administration um, and the inclusion of terms like equity, environmental justice, pathway to citizenship, pro-choice, undocumented immigrant uh, in the government websites and executive orders. And so he goes on to say, equity is meant to hearken to this idea that America is a nation that believes in everybody having this fundamental dignity of treatment. But the other side, his side, would say, what you call equity, I call discrimination. Now, if we go back a month earlier to Inauguration Day, we hear a similar theme, but from a different direction, coming from inaugural poet Amanda Gorman in an interview that night with Anderson Cooper on CNN. She said, to me, words matter. And I think that's what made this inauguration that much more sentimental and special. We've seen over the past few years how the power of words have been violated and misappropriated. What I want to do is a kind is to kind of reclaim poetry as that site in which we can pu repurify and re-sanctify. Not only the Capitol building that we saw violated, but the power of words and to invest that in the highest office in the land. We need to realize that hope isn't something that we ask of our others. It's something that we have to demand of ourselves. And that's what I wanted the poem to end on. <clears throat> <clears throat> and so we have this contest for words. And I want to consider that religious role and ramifications of that contest. But to get there, I want to mention two articles that are shaping my thinking. The first is The Uncertainty Paradox by Haas and Cunningham. It's a political psychology article from 2014. And they conducted experiments dealing with how people respond politically to uncertainty. Uncertainty leads to anxiety. And there was some research suggesting that people address that anxiety by wanting to learn more and to engage in compromise and political discourse. But other research that suggests that anxiety causes people to become closed-minded and defensive, leading to political intolerance. And so what their research did was to look into an independent um, factor the level of perceived threat. Now that's not the probability of harm, but the perception of the possibility of harm coming from that uncertainty. And what they found is that, um, a, that a sense of threat does affect how people respond to uncertainty, which may seem common sense, but um, this is a helpful framing that they had. Their conclusion was, although uncertainty may sometimes result in reduced tolerance, there are many situations in which uncertainty will lead to a willingness to explore new and different ideas. Indeed, governing in a democratic society involves resolving uncertainty through su such exploratory behavior and when operating optimally through an open exchange of ideas. Critically, the present research demonstrates that threat is an important moderator of the relationship between uncertainty and tolerance. So the sense of being threatened is a key determination of the willingness to trust and engage in the tolerance of difference that's necessary for democracy, for building trust. There needs to be a lower sense of threat. And so the differences that we saw in the language in the previous comments are a difference between the language of threat and the language of hope. Language of threat to increase the anxiety versus the language of hope that um, can lead to greater tolerance. So that's the first article that I'm drawing from in my thought. The other one is from Richard Hofstadter, his 1963 classic essay, The Paranoid Style of American Politics. Again, it's from 1963, but it remains influential. And it's frequently referenced um, to explain the appeal of conspiracy theories. It was just featured in the headline investigative report two days ago in the Philadelphia Inquirer, my local newspaper. Um, and it's 
frequently referenced by Travis View, who writes about QAnon for the Washington Post and has a podcast dealing with the QAnon movement. Um, so it is still very much an influence today. Now, I don't want to get into too much of the details of his ar article, but I do want to say, um, sorry, I think that slide is out of order, um, that he does trace the history of the um, detail, the history of the emotional political response to grand conspiracy theories that are a key part of American political history. Now, the villain that has been projected has changed from Masons to Catholics to Jews to Muslims to gold dealers. Largely anything but straight white Protestants would fit the scheme at various times in American history. But it has always been there as part of American politics. And he argued in 1963 that um, mass media has increased the sense of um, specificity and vividness in these um, villains that are portrayed, increasing the emotional response. And so this paranoid style is seen that unknown as a threat to take us back to what we had talked about before. And it must be exposed to eliminate um, that uncertainty of hiddenness. Okay. And so to just update for a moment, um, within his basic understanding that there is this paranoid element, this irrational sense for conspiracies, what um, is lifted up is, or what I would say is the digital increases that specific specificity and vividness even more. There is a greater rapidness of contract of contact and spreading ideas. Um, there's perhaps a siloing of thought um, and the reach of a few. A Facebook article recently, um, a study by Facebook showed that a handful of people relatively are behind the bulk of the doubt about vaccines for COVID. So it's a, um, there is a difference there in intensity, but not, it's not something new. And I do want to pick one historical example to just give us a sense of where this is coming from. Um, in 1798, um, the Scottish scientist John Robeson had his proofs against um, religious and the governments of Europe, um, basically against the Mason, Freemasons. And he pitted it as an anti-Christian movement, a movement that um, promoted sexuality, promoted abortion, and the abolition of property rights. Basically, the framework that is still very much there in right-wing conspiracies, theories. Um, and particularly for our purposes, um, it was very quickly picked up among particularly Puritans, but really all of the Protestants of New England were we're starting to preach against this. So there's a long history of tying in to particularly Protestant thinking, this sense of um, these conspiracies out there, this some group that's there trying to take control hidden behind um, everything that's going on. And um, Hofstadter's conclusions about this are still relevant too. He says that the paranoid spokesman sees the fate of conspiracy in apocalyptic terms. He traffics in the birth and death of whole worlds, whole political orders, whole systems of human values. And beyond that, since what is at stake is absolute good versus absolute evil, there can be no mediation and compromise in social conflict. Again, this is coming from Hofstadter. And so what I would want to say drawing from this is that it is this apocalyptic binary that brings with it language of ultimate threat. So, and so it triggers a full closure of willingness to engage with any political or cultural difference. And again, this is, becomes tied in with Protestant thought, particularly from early on in American history. And so that does bring us back to the religious thought. And particularly, I want to focus as a Protestant theologian on that Protestant tendency then to speak in apocalyptic terms. Um, that the religious realm is, what I would say is the religious realm is the realm of metaphors for making sense of the whole world, for whole political orders, for whole systems of human values, as Hofstadter said. 
So the question for us that I want to raise is whether the metaphors cultivated by a religious community are ones that heighten a sense of threat or do they reduce the sense of threat? And that becomes the key issue, I would say, for religious communities today. What kind of metaphors are being used to speak of the religious within life? It's that um, this is where the apocalyptic rhetoric becomes an issue in that it is a binary rhetoric of good versus evil, right versus wrong. And in that opposition, something is identified as a threat. And that is what causes that tension or um, threat, anxiety. And so I would say within Protestant Christianity, there is a certain tendency um, in many um, to use this apocalyptic rhetoric that ties into this openness to conspiracy theories. Um, we can certainly in conservative circles point to the binary metaphors of are you saved or not? Who will be left behind? The corruption of the world versus the purity of God as just some examples. Um, yet I would also want to say that you can also find this in more liberation sort of circles. And I would generally consider myself sympathetic, if not part of a liberation approach to theology. And so this is more an inside caution than a full-fledged critique, but rather to say that there is a tendency to use the symbol of the righteousness of the kingdom of God to give a revolutionary edge to theological formations of a prophetic call for justice. In this formulation, there is a danger of mirroring that which is being resisted. In each case, a good, evil, right, wrong binary of conflict is imagined, and the metaphors thus project a sense of conflict and threat. And while this is often contextually helpful, it becomes harmful when we universalize it. And so, to address this issue, Catherine Keller, the theologian, calls for a counter-apocalyptic theology. Um, that is not non-eschatological thinking, not a rejection of a call to justice, but rather questioning any eschatological teleology of aiming towards some ultimate unity rather than the coalition or openness to difference. So she explains that Ethical discernment as to what is better and what is worse frees itself from the habit of apocalypse, the habit of good versus evil. It can cure itself, first of all, from the fallacy of the binary alternative that allows it to perceive no alternative to the either or of absolute truth, good, versus mere relativism, evil. And so counter-apocalyptic theology seeks to avoid this binary pure motives versus evil motives as a way of building trust. And so she's arguing not for relativism, but a focus on relationalism as a means of enacting counter-apocalypse. In other words, counter-apocalyptic thinking is focused on coalition building um, in search of the common good, rather than in its approach of seeking justice, not insisting on uniformity. And so to think about the apocalyptic, um, it's not just about the end, it does mean an unveiling, but but that's more than just transparency. That is, transparency is the approach of exposing, unearthing, uncovering, laying bare what is. This is the work of the conspiracy theorist to say this is the way things really are, to render the world in a um, systematizable, calculable way. On the other hand, opacity is about the hiddenness, the hidden excess of the incalculable in the world. And so I'm calling out for metaphors of opacity over um, transparency. In the Gospel of John, for example, word, light, and flesh are interrelated. The word is known in the flesh, which allows the word to be seen as light. Word, flesh, and light are all essential to the glory of God. But this is an opaque glory, one that points to more that cannot be seen, cannot be fully understood, cannot be systematized. It's an excess of transcendence behind the imminence. And so these kinds of metaphors, rather than transparency, are what can build a space of trust by eliminating that sense of conflict. And so to say religious life might become a space where words build hope rather than are employed so that the engagement with the uncertainty becomes possible. 
hope is lifted as a celebration of the possible, the opaque, and the uncertain that could bring good, could bring trust. And so it's a matter of tending to the metaphors that are used, not the oppositional ones, but rather, or the clear binary ones, but ones that build co coalition, um, a celebration of difference. Um, and that is part of the religious life is that symbolism, um, rituals, liturgy, in an open sense, not a restrictive sense, that religion can be a space for these rituals of connection and hope for a common good. And that can be done virtually, um, certainly can be done in person, but there's also the ability then to start thinking virtually how to have these rituals that do build sense of trust by relieving the sense of threat so that that coalition can be engaged in, in compromise. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, that was brilliant. Thank you. A really uh, helpful um, historical overview of the roots of paranoia within religious systems. Um, and, but also, you know, offering some resources and some thinking within religion uh, that can counteract that kind of, as you say, that binary, that totalitarian apocalyptic binary that, that rules out any other alternatives. So thank you for setting the scene so well. I really appreciate that. Uh, it's now my great pleasure to introduce um, our second uh, keynote speaker in this webinar. Um, uh, Dr. Beth Singler is Junior Research Fellow in Artificial Intelligence at Homerton College, University of Cambridge. Her anthropological research explores the stories we tell about ourselves about artificial intelligence and robotics, as well as their social, ethical, philosophical, and religious implications. Her first documentary on AI, Pain in the Machine, won the 2017 AHRC Best Research Film of the Year Award. And she was one of the Evening Standards Progress 1000 in both 2017 and 2018, and in 2020 was one of the 21 to watch. She has spoken at the Hay Festival, the London Science Museum, the Edinburgh Science Festival, Ars Electronica and New Scientist Live. So Beth, uh, we're very grateful for you being with us this evening and we look forward very much to your uh, take on this theme. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Let me just share my slides as well. Let's get this to work. Uh, that one. Okay. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm an anthropologist and I probably come at this question from a slightly different approach, but I think that might be useful as well. And I want to start with uh, questions around Q and the nature of Q and QAnon and the direction in which that technology has been the direction in which technology has been approached with that group and that formation, and then apply some of those ideas to artificial intelligence and then loop back around to see how both those things could have combined in very interesting ways. So I, I'm sure some people are familiar with this particular moment in time on the 6th of January 2021, the storming of the Capitol. We have an image here of a gentleman in a hoodie that says, trust the plan, one of the key mottos of QAnon. And I've put it there as a title to, to have something to return to as a, as a suggestion of a, a quote that's key to my talk today. Um, who is Q? In some ways, it doesn't even really matter who Q is. It's a technologically mediated other that is only approached by some people through forms of social media, a platform, a space that's online. He's leaving messages and they're being interpreted in particular ways. Now, I do recommend the uh, documentary Q Into the Storm if you want to know more and actually perhaps have a suggestion of who Q literally is. But in some senses, as the director here says, Cullen Hoback, let's treat Q like it's a magic trick. It doesn't matter if it's a person or not. Let's show how the magic trick works. Let's demystify it because once you know how a magic trick works, it can't work again. If we're going to deal with movements and communities of conspiracy theorists like this, perhaps unpacking these elements of how they work and how they operate is useful to get behind the scenes. As in The Wizard of Oz, perhaps looking for the man behind the curtain through the te technological mediated space. Interestingly, in fact, in some ways, uh, Q's methods are actually relatively low tech. The drops themselves, again, talking about words and the strength and power of words, 
they're, they're hints towards prophetic realities and truths that Q claims to have access to. They're not mediated through hugely advanced technology, although there's some encryption work there going on. But what's really important in terms of technology is what is driving people to this, this material and these ideas. And some of the ways in which this happens, we've seen come out in the, the disturbance around Cambridge Analytica's work and what kind of methods they were employing to really identify groups and target them with specific messages during the election. And we've already mentioned the idea of the social media bubbles, the ways in which uh, people online are being corralled into particular groups by algorithmic forces. And of course, there are always humans behind these algorithmic forces, again, the wizard behind the machine. And that's what I want to try and talk about a little bit in terms of artificial intelligence and the way that we perceive it. Now, tech's solution to this problem of disinformation and misinformation on their own platforms is actually to propose more and more artificially intelligent solutions, more data from users and more involvement and engagement, uh, rather than a kind of direct banning in some cases. So again, we've got this sense of tech in a corporate sense, employing artificial intelligence and telling us almost trust the plan as well as much as Q does to say that this is direction in which we're going with technology and artificial intelligence in in particular and it will work out fine i want to delve a little bit deeper into what trust actually is and again i'm approaching this more from an anthropological perspective with some philosophical elements so for some it's a cognitive category as russell hardin said in 2006 it all depends on an assessment of the trustworthiness of the potential trusted person but that's a slightly limited definition. I want to expand it. He also said trust may be encapsulated in reciprocal expectations. Now, drawing on more anthropological approaches, we have to draw in the non-human along with the human in those reciprocal expectations. So, for example, the work of Alberto Cusino Jimenez in 2011 talks about this, this the unity of trust in both human and non-human forms. He also says it belongs to the realm of the intersubjective, as in the relationships between humans and things, in as much as it belongs to the interobjective as well. So there's both the human and the thing in a trust-based relationship. And when it comes to technology and artificial intelligence, it happens as well because we sometimes consider things to be beings before they actually are. And in the case of artificial intelligence, the performance and the representation of AI as a thinking entity leads us into that anthropomorphism. So it's actually really easy to find examples online of people talking about how they will trust AI as a being, as a person, as an entity, more than they perhaps trust human beings. And this occurs, obviously, in the space where politics is discussed. I've got some examples here. Someone saying, I trust AI more than I trust Republicans in particular. Um, at this point, someone says, I trust AI more than the government. Uh, someone calling on Elon Musk to ask him to get going on the Skynet project, a reference to the Terminator series of films, saying, I trust AI more than our current leaders. And in this instance, I'm thinking about the, element, the times in which we trust too much our technological solutions and artificial intelligence in particular. Science fiction wonderfully gets there before uh, the real world does on many occasions and, and as a warning perhaps of the direction in which we're going. I'm thinking in particular of the inevitable conflict by Isaac Asimov in the 1950s, a short story where AI world minds are in charge of directing logistics, strategy, placing humans in particular roles. And in this particular short story, humans are being harmed through the world AI's choices, which seems to be in contradiction to the laws of robotics, in particular the first law, uh, saying that no ro robot may cause a human to come to harm. But what's actually happened, as Moff describes in the story, that a fourth law of robotics has evolved that says a robot may not injure humanity or through inaction allow humanity to come to harm, the zeroth law, the one that supersedes the first law about harming particular humans. Now, this is, of course, a development of utilitarian argument that the greatest good for the greatest number must be enabled, which means that certain specific humans can be harmed as long as the majority succeed and thrive, a sort of modern version of the trolley problem by Asimov uh, illustrated there. In the story, Dr. Susan Calvin, the robo-psychologist who's been sent to investigate this, basically shrugs and says, well, as long as the most people are being helped and rather than being harmed, this is all good. There's a sense in which the rationality of the robot is presumed. The world AI can do no wrong as long as it's helping the most people. 
In more mo modern science fiction stories like Westworld, we see a version of this in season three with the creation of a thing called Roboam, an AI that can collect all the data of all the people and secure the best possible life path for them, or if needs be, cause them harm for the greater good of the greatest number. So uh, a character called Liam, who is the son of the inventor of Reboam, speaks to Dolores, who is actually, uh, spoilers, but I don't think a very big spoiler, herself a synthetic life form. He says, my dad thought the biggest problem in the world was unrealized potential, Liam tells Dolores. He thought that if you could chart a course for every single person, then you can make the world a better place. A path for everyone, Dolores replies, and Liam nods. Trust the plan. In the real world, when actual algorithmic decision-making systems implement decisions on behalf of other people and decide their life course, things can go horribly wrong. And I'm thinking particularly of the UK-based example of last year's A-levels algorithm problem. Um, Off-course grading algorithm uh, made decisions based on limiting the numbers of how many people, students could receive certain grades. They predicted grades based on historic successes or failures of the student's school. So if you went to a traditionally not great performing school and yet you were a brilliant, brilliant student, your grades would be detrimentally affected because of that. And in the result, downgraded around 40% of the students' predicted results. It's very easy in this instance, um, as ha happened, and you can see in this protest, to fall into, again, anthropomorphic thinking about the algorithm and say the algorithm decided, the algorithm did X or Y, the algorithm downgraded. The agency in this instance, as with most artificial intelligence forms, was more with the humans involved with the system who decided what would be weighted in particular ways. An assumption about the fact that if you went to a traditionally badly uh, performing school, you yourself must be a traditionally badly performing student. And this was a decision based on human ideas about history and data, and the algorithm worked as it was told to work. However, the narrative from the government was around mutant algorithms, sort of a, a narrative of evolution as though this thing has developed accidentally and spontaneously changed in these particular ways. And this is absolutely not what happened at all, but it fed into the same sort of dystopic narrative and re rhetoric that was present in the, in the protests and present in uh, descriptions of the algorithm elsewhere as well. Now, this is in contrast in some ways to our Prime Minister Boris Johnson's previous statements about the future of AI, but it shares some of the same ideas about the agency of algorithms that sort of defers responsibility. So when he spoke to the UN in, on the 25th of September in 2019, he gave a very binary understanding. Again, we're returning to binaries. I think that's an important point. A binary understanding of what artificial intelligence would be. Would it be helpful robots washing and caring for an aging population or pink-eyed terminators sent back from the future to call the human race? This was a very utopian versus dystopian interpretation of what AI could and should be. And it, again, it, it placed the responsibility on that onto the agency of the AI itself. And if you know your Terminator science fiction, the idea that conscious robots awaken by Skynet being in charge, sent off to destroy humans. There's no sense that humans are in the loop at all. And again, the more utopian idea of caring robots being placed in contrast with that. Now, I'd argue that these extremes of AI agency are actually a distraction from actual problems of disinformation caused by algorithmic technology. So, for instance, here, just one example, deep fake technology. How are we going to cope when our information that we receive can be perfectly mapped onto other people's faces so that we don't entirely trust who's even telling us what we're seeing? Uh, this is, of course, in its own way, a continu continuity with previous problems of misinformation but the skill and the technology perhaps make it more and more likely that these, are, these videos will go viral, that they'll be more possible to be believed, or perhaps conversely lead to a state of distrust for all forms of media uh, so that we don't know at, at all where we should lie on trusting or distrusting things. But if we hand over super agency to AI and algorithms, perhaps we don't see these more immediate threats and issues around disinformation. So returning to Q, I think there are some very specific similarities between Q and AI that perhaps are useful to think through. Both are in a sense a ghost of the machine. They're technologically mediated interactions, but with humans still behind the curtain. And this is true even in the most advanced AI that we currently have. And it's worth bearing that in mind. Similarly, human representations of AI commonly talk of a direction of change, as we see with Q, often including sort of prophecies of great change and disruption, as with the coming storm we see with QAnon. 
Um, but these prophecies, I think it's worth thinking of them as also social commentary on the present. And we've talked a little bit, bit already with Eric's presentation about the fear of wokeness and the fear of leftism. And this is a sort of social commentary on where we're at if we're prophesizing a coming storm. And with AI, there is a prophecy of a better world through the exponential growth of intelligence. But both act in ways that are interpreted by humans as being superior in agency, in knowledge and in benevolence. So, for instance, from my research, looking at ways in which people talk about these algorithmic decision making systems, I keyed down into this particular phrase, blessed by the algorithm, and looked at examples that people have tweeted out, both around their sort of more abstract sense of having been blessed in some way, or specific instances of success or failure in gig economy roles, in content production, in recommendation systems that highlight a particular song, perhaps, that you enjoy. And then the variety of religious and pseudo-religious language and parody, where the metaphors that Eric was talking about partially are being, you know, they're running away from us and being used in these different fields and spaces that leads to a sense of uh, greater trust because you see these algorithms as super agents able to make these sorts of decisions for us far earlier than they are actually technologically able and perhaps actually in most cases demonstrate something more akin to artificial stupidity than artificial super intelligence. So in these kinds of tweets, the blessed by the algorithm tweets, we see users reaching for what I would call culturally familiar concepts and language and metaphor to express the understanding of something that is to them inexplicable and non-transparent. AI is sort of standing in in some spaces for God. Now I don't support a rather strict version of the secularization thesis or a pathological interpretation of religion as fulfilling a need that this, this idea then fits into that slot in that sense. Instead, I think this is a continuity of enchantments that are still entangled in the West. And we've sort of had this binary of West and East over who gets to think of things in an enchanted way and who doesn't because of a narrative of the Enlightenment. But these ideas are still very much entangled with our conceptions of technology and artificial intelligence in particular. So I think my, my sort of concluding thoughts on this to go back to Q again and AI as a sort of parallel to it is that if we grant super agency to such technologically mediated others, figures behind the scene, be they human or artificial intelligence, this can lead to disinformation and harms. And going back to questions about transparency, that again, we need to think of it as a magic trick that we, we demystify, we understand what's behind artificial intelligence, what's behind these digital spaces, how they work, how the algorithm works, if all that can become transparent, then this, this trick fails to work anymore. And we can regain our own sense of agency as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>